Afternoon Theatre presents Turn, Turn, Turn by Sheila Hodgson, based on an idea by M. R. James. Turn, turn, turn. As I grow older, I come increasingly to believe that friendship is the main thing. It gave me great pleasure to receive, early in 1898, a letter from a very old friend of mine, the Reverend Nicholas Fenton, whom I'd not seen for years. Unfortunately, all was not well with him. For some reason, which I couldn't fathom, he appeared to think that his son was going to the devil. He wrote in terms of considerable urgency, begging me to spend a weekend at the vicarage and give the young man the dubious benefit of my advice. I'm not fond of Norfolk. I had a horrid conviction that it would rain, and it did. Still, one does what one can. Charles Fenton had been up at King's for quite a while. I felt a certain responsibility. Saturday night found me sitting in front of the vicarage fire, drinking sherry and attempting to find out what in the name of wonder ailed my old friend. That it should come to this. I beg your pardon? Come to what? Hmm? I'm no great scholar, Dr. James. In my innocence, I have admired. God forgive me, I've even boasted of his talent. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Charles has done extremely well. He has done nothing of the sort, sir. My dear Fenton, since I received your letter, I have made certain inquiries. I spoke to Charles's tutor. They seem very content with his progress at college. I blame myself. I should never have consented. Oh, how steep is the path that leads to damnation. Oh, bless my soul. If your son has got a little drunk or spent rather too much money... Well, you've heard no rumours, uh, no scandalous tales? Certainly not. But I do wish you'd speak plainly. I will have no secrets from you. In brief, then, it is my intention to remove Charles from Cambridge. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You, of course, do not approve. It would uh, possibly be unfair and definitely unwise to remove him in the middle of his studies. But I have no choice. Oh, don't, I pray you, consider my feelings in this matter. You must know why I have to act. On my word, I don't. It is no kindness to conceal the truth from me. And there is no point. I am in possession of all the squalid facts. Then you have the advantage of me. I appeal to you, sir. My dear fellow, if there's something you are trying to tell me, you really must come straight out and say it. I can't think of any other convenient method. Good heavens, can you be in genuine ignorance? Yes. This is most distressing or embarrassing. Well, very well, then. I speak of my son's faith, or rather lack of it. Ah, there is a religious problem. Oh, for some time I've been concerned, indeed alarmed by his opinions, his blasphemous remarks. I have discovered the most pernicious books in his room, and quite by accident I heard that he has been going to theosophist meetings. He has even written to Madame Blavatsky. Has he indeed? How very interesting. Well, I faced him with it. He brazenly maintains his right to come and go as he pleases and think whatever he likes. Youth is a time of experiment, you know. As a Christian, I have tried to understand, to lead him back. But how can I fight the subtle temptations of Cambridge? Temptation is everywhere, Fenton. I do assure you we have no monopoly of it at King's. I am a plain man. To my mind, you cannot touch pitch without being defiled. And these abominable free thinkers. I will not stand by and see my son dragged slowly into the bottomless pit. And so he talked, and the rain spat against the windows, and I sat on, becoming steadily more worried by the whole situation. Clearly, the Reverend Mr. Fenton had been listening to some lurid gossip. He had formed a grossly inaccurate picture of poor Charles and genuinely believed he had a moral duty to rescue that young man from Cambridge. 
It did occur to me to point out that his son could meet free thinkers in any part of the country and write to Madame Blavatsky from his home address, but I desisted. He was a good, simple man. I retreated to my bedroom, where I was instantly ambushed by Charles. Come in. Good evening, Dr. James. Ah, Charles. How very pleasant to see you. Well, I heard you arrive. Look, uh, have you been talking to my father? <laughs> my dear boy, you wouldn't expect us to sit in total silence, I hope. Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I, I mean about me. You may have been mentioned from time to time, yes. Well, he's trying to take me away from Cambridge. Oh, I believe. Well... He can't do it. I mean, but he's got to help her ruin my entire life. Oh, dear, dear, dear. I must say, your family have a most unfortunate talent for melodrama. Well, he thinks I'm going to hell. I think he's a dim-witted old goat. Conceive it possible that you are both mistaken. The gong rescued me after many further entanglement, and presently we all went into dinner. Here, the Reverend Mr. Fenton stared gloomily at the saddle of lamb, as if foreseeing a bad end for that, too. While Charles kept winking at me, rolling his eyes and muttering under his breath, it was all exceedingly hard on the digestion. Only the mention of my ghost stories brought father and son into some kind of agreement. And as I sat listening to their most pleasant compliments, I had an idea. A sudden notion. All at once, I saw a way to make my point in the guise of light entertainment. Would you circulate the port, Dr. James? Yes, indeed. Uh, you enjoy fiction, then? Well, yes. <laughs> the better sort of fiction, most certainly. And yet, you know, fact can be every bit as fascinating. Only the other day, I came across a very curious story, an incident which occurred at King's College in 1539. Oh, the students were a different kind in those days, I imagine. Oh, do you? Oh, I don't. Oh, dear me, I think I should have been entirely comfortable in one of the Renaissance universities. Manners change, I fancy, but not the basic human animal. Can we have the story, sir? Oh, I shall become weary soon, I fear. No, no, no. Uh, please. Oh, it gives us great pleasure to hear your tale, Dr. James. Oh, well, then, since you press me. It concerns two young men, rather younger than yourself, Charles. In those days, student life began a great deal earlier. Uh, may I hand you the port? Mm, thank you. Uh, these two, whose names were Mark Palgrave and Chauncey Adam received one day a really rather alarming summons. It came in the form of a note, a curt message in the handwriting of Sir John Cheek, provost of kings. And uh, as they sat in their lodging... Have you seen this? What in the name of God does he want? Our company, it seems. Oh, think, Chauncey, what have you done, man? I? Nothing, upon my word. And you have an identical note, friend. So... So what have you done? Hmm? Oh, I knew a girl last summer. Oh, but this is commonplace. Oh, let me consider. I have been drunk in Master Julian's chambers. <laughs> I have also slept through his more tedious lectures. And so have I. And so has half the world. If he has lodged a complaint against me... Oh, there's a pontificating ass. I entirely destroyed one of his classes last month by arriving somewhat late. Uh, sir, says I, your pardon... I struck a stranger's hat off, and it fell into the river. No matter, says he, <coughs> testily. Be seated, be seated. Would you delay us for a hat? Oh, no, says I. And I rejoice to hear it's no matter, because his head was in it. <laughs> <laughs> Did he believe you? Above the laughter? No. Yet he has spoken to the provost. Surely then... A pox on Master Julian. Well, there must be some grave matter. Or well, the record of your studies. It is no better... And no worse than your own, friend. Pass the wine. We shall discover all in the morning. Are you afraid? Are you... Well, there's no reason. Then we are not afraid. Light the candles. Here comes night. They sat late, uncovering small misdemeanors and trading minor sins. And still they couldn't fathom why the great Sir John wanted them. As the candle grease trickled down onto the table, I think Chauncey fell asleep while his companion drew a cloak around him and stared deep into the lengthening shadows. 
Whatever dream troubled them, whatever imagination threw up by way of explanation, I can assure you it bore no relation to the truth. Oh, dear Bino. In the morning, Sir John Cheek, and he had been appointed by the king, eyed them from behind his great desk. Gentlemen, you know why you are brought hither? Your pardon, sir? You sent for us, sir. And why? Oh, Master Palre, Master Adam, examine your conscience. Is there nothing you would confess to me? Confess? I am grieved beyond measure. Yet I am prepared to listen to an honest avowal of your sins. Speak. If my work has failed to measure up to your high standards, Sir John, I, I, I can but regret and promise to make amends. Faith, if Master Julian is enraged over the hat, I cry his pardon. It was a jest. Hold your peace, sir. No evasion can serve you now. God looks down upon us. Therefore, speak. Master Adam, Master Belgrave, you stand before me in mortal peril. Are you not conscious of the power of the Almighty? Speak, and I shall endeavor to be merciful. What? Are you silent? Sir John, we are uncertain of what offense... Blasphemer. Your pardon. I fail to comprehend your meaning. So? So? You shall be enlightened, Master Adam. You shall be made acquaint of your position. To put it plainly, sir, you are both detected in your sin. Sir? You have been seen trafficking with the Witch of Lulworth. How say you? The Witch of Lulworth, Mistress Norris. Now, are you not afraid? The charge is not true. I deny it absolutely. Yet you change colour, sir. And your companion names... Oh, Jesus. Jesus in heaven, we are not guilty of witchcraft, Sir John. I beg you to believe us. We have done no such abomination on my own. You waste time and breath. You have been named. By whom? The woman herself. Impossible. I have never cut eyes on the witch. Oh, no, 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 I, sir. I, I, you've made some hideous mistake. I would guard your tongue, sir. I should warn you, I have another witness. Master Julian testifies to passing you both on the road to Lulworth at Cockrow with blood daubed on your face. What day? At what time? What time did you say? Cockcrow? And what brought Master Julian abroad at Cockcrow? We can prove these accusations false. Do you call the Vice Provost a liar? He is mistaken in his opinion. Then you can produce evidence to the contrary. I speak of a certain night in June, the 24th to be precise. We were in our lodgings, sir. A bed. <laughs> Asleep, would you tell me? Yes. Who can swear to it? Oh, mother of God, nobody. It is hardly possible in the middle of the night. And this is all the answer I am to get. No man to speak for you. Do you conceive the gravity of the charge? Indeed, yes. Had we but known... Oh, I had you but known. You would have come provided with half a dozen false witnesses. No, no sir. I make no doubt of that. You plead ignorance, then. Not ignorance. Innocence. We have done no wrong. And swear the same upon holy writ. Yes. We have done nothing to offend the church. That is for the church to decide, I think. No. No, never lift up your hands to me. In spite of the repugnance, the loathing I feel for your abominable sorceries, I am determined to act fairly. I have had the deposition from Master Julian, the sworn statement of the witch herself, and I have listened to you. Mark me now. With patience. Sir John, you cannot believe such a farrago of lies. Will you be silent? There is no direct proof of your guilt, only a most strong presumption. Therefore, you escaped the just penalty for your sins. But there is no doubt in my mind that you are both an evil and a pernicious influence on this college 
a danger which I intend to root out. You will leave Cambridge directly. But at least give us and time. I to risk the moral health of students in my care. You are an infection, a plague. I must and will be rid of you at once. This is a mockery of justice. Are we not to be heard? You will leave by the end of the week. I can only beg you to repent of your sins. And I assure you, I shall pray for your immortal souls. You may consider yourselves exceeding fortunate. Men have been burnt at the stake for less. In the name of God, get you gone, sirs. But they didn't consider themselves fortunate. Oh, dear me, no. The more they debated, the worse it looked. To be accused of witchcraft was unlucky enough. But at a time when the church was in a state of upheaval, and far too many people informing against their neighbor, not good, not good. After the interview with him, our two heroes were under no illusion. They had escaped for the moment only. Anything might happen between Cambridge and London. So, they sat on the backs at King's and threw pebbles into the water and tired the sun with talking. What is to be done? A, a written statement swearing allegiance to the true church and King Edward. Oh, that's a vain hope. A direct appeal to the king. To what end? Edward's a sickly child. Put not your faith in princes, friend. And Master Buchanan says King Henry would burn men of different religions in the same bonfire if it suited his purpose. Oh, God help us, oh, blessed Virgin, oh, St. Nicholas, our patron. Oh, king. peace. But we are fathoms deep in danger, certainly. Oh, doing nothing. This is so monstrous unjust. Do you know, I fancy it's harder to defend yourself against a totally groundless charge. Had there been truth in the accusation, one would have been better prepared. Shall we go, then, to London? Where else? I have another thought. To Lulworth. Yes, there lies the best hope. To Lulworth and at once. I mean to confront Mistress Norris. The witch herself? She must recant. She must clear both of us. She must and shall bear witness. And so they set out along the road to Endor. Or, rather, along the winding lanes which led to Huntingdon and the village of the witch. Long before they arrived at the turning for Lulworth, night caught them, trudging beside the hedgerows. Oh, we'll not get there before dawn. Are you weary? A little cold, no more. I wish there had been a moon. The clouds may lift. Indeed, I think they do. There's a rim of light beyond the trees. Hold, what's amiss? Can you smell birding? No. Oh, I can. A faint scorching odour on the wind. And listen. Oh, you hurt my arm. Jeez, you, my God. Back. Back. Oh, would you have me in the ditch? I've caught my cloak on the briars. Have a care or we'll both fall. There's something coming. How so? Listen, man. Lord Almighty, can you not hear? Voices. At this hour of the night? Be still. Look, a sudden jet of flame flickering against the sky. Get behind the hedge. Fast. Whatever thing approaches, I have no mind to meet with it. With torches, like that. God send me I'm not discovered. The wicked are dead. Not a pity. Who are they? God knows. From some village. What do they do at this unholy hour? It matters not. So long as they pass us by. But down. Throw your cloak over your head. Oh, 
these people mad? Mad or sane? They're gone. Oh, wait. Stay down. I can still see the flicker of their torches. Chauncey. Oh, peace. What witness revelry they keep, I know not, neither do I care. Can you rise? I saw them plain as they passed along the road. Give me your hand. And be mindful of the ditch. I saw the leader dancing like a goat in the torchlight. Be advised. We have heard nothing. We have seen nothing. And we must be gone. The shadow swooped and blackened the hedgerow. Yet I saw his face for one instant in the flame. Make haste. Chauncey, Chauncey, I know the man. In truth? And so do you. Speak, then. It was Master Julian. Julian? Possible. Yes. Yes, why not? Chauncey, have you understood me? Very completely, friend. You believe you have seen our learned master. It follows, therefore, that he was attacking us to shield himself. A common practice. Hold. No, no, that will not do. They were not practicing witchcraft. They chanted holy songs and called upon the Lord. God knows what they were doing. Come, we must find Lulworth before dawn. I have no fancy to be caught entering the village. And so they walked on, rather quickly now, and didn't look behind them anymore. They reached Lulworth around two in the morning and slept for several hours under a haystack. On rising, they approached the farmhouse cautiously and spoke to a farm labourer. What's that? What's that? For your private ear, fellow. We have business with Mistress Beth Morris. Have you now? Can you tell us where she may be found? The information is worth money. Oh. Ah, well, I can tell you where to find her. Holy saints, you can find her without difficulty. But as to business, why, you've wasted your journey. Why? Will she not deal with strangers? Oh, she has no choice, I'm thinking. <laughs> then of your charity, where is she? You don't know, master. If I knew, should I be asking you? Oh, you're too late, good sir. She's gone then? No, oh, no, no. She's right here. And likely to stay here for all eternity. <laughs> she, she's six feet underground. <laughs> Which was, as you could imagine, a considerable shock. Oh dear, yes. They felt the ground collapse beneath them. But this was a desperately unlucky chance. Mistress Beth Norris, the witch of Lulworth, lay dead and could give no evidence, either for or against them. Questioning revealed that the witch had been stoned to death the day before and her body thrown into an old gravel pit beyond the village. Need I tell you that the yelling, capering mob encountered by the boys had just come from this gruesome ceremony? They stood bemused in the middle of the farmyard. They really had no idea what to do. I think it was Chauncey who declared his intention of visiting the woman's cottage, a suggestion which considerably alarmed Mark. Yet he followed, as he generally did. To what end? There may be writings, a document, something that might clear us. And I have no such rocketing hope. And if we are seen... It's daylight. Half the village will be out in the fields, depend on it. And the other half sleeping off the effects of yesterday's debauch. I would rather we wait till dark. I would not. Time is the enemy. With every second, danger takes a pace nearer to us. I would not linger in this accursed village. Come, let us see such evidence as we can find and be gone. So, most horribly self-conscious, dreadfully aware of their alien look in that rustic landscape, they approached the witch's house. It had been fairly thoroughly looted. The door swung on a hinge and all the windows were smashed. Some attempt had been made to burn the place. Stone walls had prevented that, though the curtains lay in ashes and an acrid reek of smoke still lingered near the ceiling. Cooking pots and dishes had been thrown to the floor, a few poor bits of furniture hacked to pieces. Chauncey slipped and skidded on a broken egg as they entered. A burst sack of flour lay near the grate. It didn't seem ominous or magical, or, to be frank, particularly devilish. Merely the scattered remnants of somebody's home. We shall find nothing in here. It could be any laborer's cot. True. No black cat, no stuffed toads, not even, I swear, a broomstick. God damn the people! 
They could have struck her down sometime, hence. Why now? Why now? No papers of any sort? Since you in heaven, we are lost. And I can still smell burning. Oh, let's be gone. Hold. Hold. Here's something. It's stuck high up within the chimney. Will you ruin your clothes? <coughs> oh, what are you at? Blessed St. Nicholas. Fancy star. I have it. <coughs> <coughs> oh, you've raised enough dust to choke a dozen witches. Oh, mother of God, what's there? A book. A Bible? A Latin, at least. Come over to the light. Now have a care. The pages are cracked and torn. Uh, here's something written. Horesco reference. I shudder at the word. Word? What word? Mis querunque herbas et non inoxia verba. Mingled herbs and charms of evil power. Oh, Derent, dum uh, me, me too, and let them hate. Let them hate. So long as they fear. So, so. And you spoke truth. A Bible. Of a sort. Her name, writ large on the flyleaf. Mistress Bethany Norris. Curious hand. Looped uh, and illuminated, look you, with small sly faces grinning through the curves of each letter. Now she writes in English. Can you make it out? Um, turn, turn, turn. As the earth, as the stars, as my mind doth turn, 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 turn. For the wheel spins and the fire sings. And surely the word shall triumph. Oh, what sorcery is this? I cannot tell. The book is old, stained and greasy with much use. Mark, have you some knowledge of the hidden arts? Not I. <coughs> What's that? Oh, only a brick tumbling into the fireplace. Black sorceries. Do you... Do you believe in them? Do you? Such practices are mortal sin. And lead most certainly to hellfire. Oh, throw the book away. I will. Yes. Yes. It would be folly to meddle with these dangerous toys. It, it would court damnation. I am entirely of your mind, friend. Come on, let's away. Yet, since there's no help, the holy saints desert us. And God himself remains dumb in his heaven. What do you purpose? Chauncey. Chauncey. Might there. Might there not be some way of casting a room to save us? Witchcraft. All else has failed. But you cannot mean. When reason's fled, what is to be done? Oh, put down the book, I beseech you. See. See, here's a device. And another. Requiring the bone from a newly slain corpse. John C. in God's name. Take thou the hand of one that hath been murdered, and it shall confound thy enemies. <laughs> Who's there? But there was nobody there, only the wind crying through the broken roof. They took the book and Deeply troubled, they sat beneath a haystack studying the cracked parchment. Spells, incantations, a list of weird ceremonies unrolled before their eyes. As the light drained from the sky, they crept away to the gravel pit. Mark, in particular, was most horribly afraid. Oh, Chase, you have pity on us. We shall both be damned. We are damned already. Convicted without trial, without hearing. Condemned upon the word of one malicious pedagogue. 
Oh, up hearts, we may yet come by our revenge. Oh, hide the book, hide the book if we should be surprised. No one is coming. To think she died here. And they dragged her screaming to this dreadful pit. Like the very pit of hell itself. Oh, it matters not, she's dead. They tried to burn the body. A nauseous smell of scorched flesh. Can you imagine this charred carcass as a woman? No. I can. I am very sensible of her spirit watching us. Indeed. If you were but to turn sharply. No. No. Nothing save the shadow from the moon. Solitude. And yet she is with us, Mark. Where? From what celestial crevice is she peeping down? I, I, I do not. I, I cannot. I will not believe. Then there's no harm. And you should not tremble so. What's that you hold in your palm? A bone. And this, too, was once part of Mistress Norris. A finger that she crooked and beckoned. Oh, beseech you, throw it away. But we have come for this. No, we are dealing in fearful mysteries. Let it be. In truth. In truth, friend, I had no interest in such things till Master Julian spoke forth. Nor I. He spoke in blind malice to rid himself of us, Chauncey. Oh, I. And used the occasion to destroy the Witch of Lulworth, I make no doubt. Who had become too dangerous. Oh, oh. <gasps> Who may yet be too dangerous, friend. What if the book speaks truth? Imagine. With this small bone... A man might raise all the powers of hell. Come. Come, let's away. So they began their return journey, this time by full moonlight. It bleached the fields and lit the road before them. There was no wind now, no sound of life, only a most extraordinary silence. And their footsteps padding swiftly on, mile after mile. Oh, Chauncey, I beseech you, you go altogether too fast. We must reach Cambridge before dawn. If we rested a free hour... We should lose our resolve. On, man. On. Oh, I'm so desperately weary. We cannot falter now. Oh, my shoe is unbuckled, and I have a stone most painfully rubbing against my... Oh, make Chauncey. haste in the name of God. Hold. I can hear something behind us. How so? Listen. Fatigue has blocked your ears. There is nothing. Then what is that? Now do you catch it? Now? Strange. But be still a moment. It grows louder. Not human. Therefore, beyond a doubt, some trick of the atmosphere. There is a pressure on my ears. There's a storm brewing. No, hell and damnation. Look! Mother of God, what is it? Flies. A great cloud of swarming insects. Oh, beat them off! Oh, these disgusting creatures! If I break a switch on the head! Oh, it's useless! There are too many! Run, John, see! Run! Run! And run they did, while a million black dots danced and circled above them, forming a kaleidoscope pattern against the sky. The flies actually seemed to multiply as they came, adding to their numbers with every yard. Mercifully on rounding the corner of the road, Chauncey and Mark saw the river bank ahead and hurled themselves into the water. So getting rid of the pursuing hordes. They arrived in Cambridge as the bells cried three and stood dripping wet outside the lodgings of Master Julian. Is he there? I would hazard a guess. Oh, if he should look out from his window. He will not. Oh, Chauncey, this is a most desperate remedy. The times are evil. We have no choice. Give me the book. Oh, there's someone coming. Stand back against the wall. It's the watch. Three o'clock and all's well. Three o'clock and all's well. Three o'clock, 
can all quell. <laughs> well, would he say. And Mistress Norris, help us, it's not so well after all. It shall go hard with Master Julian. Lying, treacherous hypocrite. Chauncey, it will not truly work. Who knows? And the moon has gone behind a cloud. Oh, it's too dark to read. I have the words locked in my brain. Help me, Mark. As you hope to save your neck. Else you are a dead man. Make no doubt on that. Yes. There is no choice. I see. None whatsoever. Are you ready, friend? I am prepared. Good. Take hold of the bone. Keep your eyes fixed to his window. And speak the words after me. Turn, turn, turn. Turn, turn, turn. As the earth, as the stars, as my mind doth turn. As the earth, as the stars... As my mind doth turn. For the wheel spins. 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 And the fire sings. 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 And together, Mark, we name the name. Then they spoke aloud the name of that great devil. And they threw the bone in through the open window of Master Julian's house. Now you must realize that Mark and Chauncey really didn't know anything about witchcraft. They were normal, healthy young men and none the worse for their ducking. They returned to their lodgings and slept very soundly for several hours. They woke feeling rather self-conscious and not a little ashamed of themselves. In the clear sunlight it did seem faintly absurd. And the clamor of the bells called them to altogether more sensible pursuits. I think Mark was up first and came hurrying to wake his friend. Chauncey! Chauncey! Chauncey, are you still abed? Who's that? Faith, are you expecting Sir John to come visiting? Or the Witch of Lulworth herself? <clears throat> What's the time? Past ten o'clock. Chauncey, it was a dream last <clears throat> night, beyond question. Last night? I dreamt the most preposterous matters. A dream, friend. Yes. Throw back the curtains. And woke with my head spinning. Now what's amiss? Never care. You fall headlong from the wind. Mark, what are you gazing at? There's a great crowd below. Hey, you fellow! Is there some commotion? He's dead! What city? Someone has died, it would seem. Oh, pray for the faithful. I can hardly run naked. Ah, my clothes. Go, will you? Go and discover the truth. So Mark hurried from the room and leapt down the twisting stairway and came out into the courtyard. And what he heard there sent him abruptly back. So, is King Edward dead? I have been expecting this. Not the king. Somewhat nearer home and touching us. It's Master Julian. In God's name, are you mad? Shut the door and keep your voice low as you hope to be saved. Well? He's dead. So? So? Beyond all question, dead? And by what means? Tell me that. His servant, on going to call for him, found Master Julian lying dead on the floor. Oh. And Chauncey. Chauncey. The room was full of flies. <laughs> oh, capital. <laughs> well, that is a hair-raising story, if you like. Thank you, Dr. James. We're greatly obliged to you. <laughs> Good heavens, you have a most remarkable gift. No wonder your Christmas ghost stories are celebrated. <laughs> oh, I enjoy myself at Christmas. And uh, if the boys find me entertaining, I am content. Mm, remarkable. I can almost hear those flies. Yes. Do you believe in witchcraft, sir? Oh, dear me, what a very embarrassing question. I've said this in another context, and I will say it again at the risk of repeating myself. I neither believe nor disbelieve. 
I'm prepared to consider evidence and then form my own judgment. Uh, yes, but, well, in this case, I mean, was it true? Ah. Chauncey, Adam, and Mark Palgrave were certainly true in the sense that they did exist and they were expelled from Cambridge for practicing witchcraft. Sir John Cheek was very real indeed and you may read about him in any competent history. Uh, yes, but the witch. There, I decline to commit myself. <laughs> Superstition, my dear boy. Mumbo jumbo added to ignorance and fear. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. James? Up to a point. And I'm afraid in those unenlightened days, people often accused each other of witchcraft. Isn't that so? Yes. Most unfortunate. You see, if you accuse people of unmentionable vices, there's a very real danger that they'll go away and try them. Well, otherwise, it might never have entered into their head. Hmm? Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, will you take some more port? Thank you, no. Uh, then I suggest we join the ladies. <laughs> After you. Oh, Charles, ring for Emily. I left the vicarage some days later. But it was, I think, in late July that I had a somewhat incoherent letter from Charles. He thanked me over and over again in very bad handwriting and said that his father had agreed to let him return to Cambridge. He seemed to think I had had some hand in this. Oh, dear me, I wonder if I did. Impossible, to be sure. I was guilty of one small omission. I confess I suppressed the ending to my tale. Chauncey and Mark were arrested for witchcraft and instantly hanged. A fact which I considered had little direct bearing on the plot and did absolutely nothing to help the moral of the story. The Reverend Mr. Fenton died last Christmas. I haven't seen Charles for many years. I believe he went into the diplomatic service and did rather well in India. I do hope so. I shouldn't like to think he had taken up witchcraft. Would you? Mm hmm? That was Turn, Turn, Turn by Sheila Hodgson based on an idea by M. R. James. With David March as James, Steve Hodson as Chauncey Adam, Colin Etherington as Mark Palgrave, and Gerald Cross as Sir John Cheek. The part of the Reverend Nicholas Fenton was played by Alan Lawrence, Charles Fenton by Michael Cochran, and The Labourer by William Eadle. The play was produced and directed by David Johnston. <laughs>